Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have one of the legends of business. I'm really excited to have Dan Olszewski. Dan has been the director of the Weiner Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Business for the past eight years. Go Badgers! Prior to UW-Madison, Dan was CEO and chairman of Parts Now, during which time the revenues increased from $26 million to over $400 million. That's remarkable. And he led the successful buyout in 1999. Dan, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, the successes, the mistakes, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I always like to include a fun fact that most people don't know about you. What's a fun fact? Well, the uh, cr- kind of crazy fun fact is, uh, well, the, the minor one is, I was actually president of my class uh, here at Wisconsin, uh, but as part of that, uh, when the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield was being filmed, they had uh, done a, uh, I was one of the semi-finalists for one of the bit roles in that movie. Uh, but I didn't get it, and you know who knows uh, what path it would have <laughs> been had I star had a starring role in uh, that movie. What role? What were you uh, trying out for? Well, that um, was actually the craziest part of uh, the bit role. The uh, role ended up being um, drunken college student who pukes in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> So probably, thankfully, I did not get yeah. that with my uh, one uh, scene on uh, uh, for uh, permanence uh, in the movies. But uh, that was the you were uh, too the straight and you were too straight and narrow to pull that off. Is that why they didn't? It was not a good uh, match with my yeah. Personal yeah, I mean, I saw you know computer science, uh, Madison, Harvard Business School. I don't necessarily picture you the guy puking in the bushes. <laughs> yeah, I it, it, I think that was pretty much the uh, casting decision as well. <laughs> well, so what was um, computer science like um, you were, when you were going through in Madison? Uh, it would actually is funny you ask that because uh, it's one of the areas I probably contrast the most since. At the time, it, you were just starting to have PCs, uh, that students would have PCs, but most of us didn't. And so getting computer time was actually a huge issue. So to be a major, you had to be willing to get there at 2 in the morning or be there with all these kind of crazy hours just to get time to try your program. Uh, which nowadays people can you can be sitting out on the terrace or wherever and actually working on it. Uh, so that's been a huge change. There was massive bottlenecks of just getting computing time when assignments were due. Yeah, I mean, to give people an idea of that time, what was going on in the computer industry and technology when you were when you were doing that? Yeah, that was the uh, Apple IIe was probably the hot Apple product at the mm-hmm. time. The Macintosh, uh, j- the original Macintosh had just come out, and um, IBM uh, PC was uh, starting to gain some uh, traction. In fact, they and they had a big failure too. This was back in the era of the IBM Peanut, which was this low end. PC and and their spokesperson was Charlie Chaplin lookalike and uh, you know, some things like that. Uh, I I loved reading uh, Steve uh, Jobs's biography or autobiography uh, because uh, it brought back a lot of memories of a lot of those technologies. Some of which were very successful, but a lot of them were uh, massive failures that you kind of forgot about, but at the time were big deals. Yeah, and I want to get into. I know you did a stint at IBM also, but I want to go back a little bit and hear about what was the inspiration for you growing up. Uh, I I grew up uh, in north central Wisconsin on a farm uh, in outside of Withy, Wisconsin. Very small town, about 500 people, and uh, my my parents were actually very inspirational. Uh, my dad uh, was a uh, small town banker. My mom uh, was a school teacher, and we lived on the family farm and raised beef cattle. Mm. Uh, and that so I would say. Well, you know, personally, they were very inspirational individuals, and uh, set uh, had kind of all of uh, the kids were, you know, told you can do anything and uh, be uh, successful. Um, I also I loved reading up there, and uh, I loved reading biographies. And to this day, as a small kid, I can think back to a lot of the biographies I read, in just you know, ranging from Theodore Roosevelt to Jim Plunkett, quarterback, and 
in, and I would say I like all kinds of biographies, not just business ones, but uh, I always found those you know very inspirational to you know, read about what people have done with their life. So, which are what are some of your favorite books that you recommend to entrepreneurs and students? A uh, couple that I always recommend to people are uh, actually The Black Swan uh, by oh. uh, Taleb is a great one to think about how unforeseen circumstances, uh, it's tough to predict the future and so you need to uh, plan. I would never have guessed that one. Outcomes. Yeah, it's, it's actually, a, I think, a really uh, impactful book. Uh, I do think the Steve Jobs um, book is actually a very good uh, book to read, mm -hmm. uh, if you, especially if you are thinking about here's someone who is incredibly successful uh, in so many dimensions. But when you actually hear the whole story, uh, he also was someone who had incredible failure along the way, right. and uh, it's easy for entrepreneurs uh, as they're going through the journey and facing all of the. Uh, dips in the road that they are in, um, inevitably going to run across to feel like, wow, it must be me. And this is not really what happens to successful entrepreneurs. And uh, it's it, you have to realize that no, it, even the most successful ones have had more than enough failures when you're pushing the envelope like yeah. that. So Dan, did you have to wake up early and help on the farm with the beef cattle or how did that work? <laughs> Well, you know, thankfully, and I'm always incredibly thankful for this because most of my uh, uh, 4-H friends had dairy cattle, and that's the one that you have to get up early, 365 days a year, uh, rain or shine, uh, to take care of them. Beef cattle are a little easier, so okay. I, it, you have to feed them, but uh, you don't have to get up and milk them each day. So uh, it, it was definitely a, a much easier way to, to farm, but uh, it still it gave me a, a real appreciation for the hard work that goes into that and, and an incentive to go on to college. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get interested in computers then? It was really right at the onset of the PCs as they were just starting to come out and I... Uh, it was actually pretty interesting because our school got a Apple, or I get, actually got a Radio Shack. Uh, TRS-80 was the hot uh, computer that they got the first one. And it was almost the sort of, sort of thing where they got one, but no one, in, pretty much even including the teachers at the time, knew what to do with it. Uh, right. It was this just new thing that you knew was going to be fun, but uh, it seemed to be important. But uh, no one really knew how to use it. So as um, I was someone who kind of was willing to give it a try, and uh, the teachers were always, you know, very supportive of that. So it didn't take much to be uh, kind of the resident expert, uh, if you will, when no one else uh, kind of knew a, a lot that was going on. And then once you uh, get some of that positive reinforcement, you start to get more and more interested in it, and then you. Uh, start to learn more about it but it was really just at the onset where uh, people everyone we were all pretty much starting at round zero yeah the, what did it, it do what did it do at the time that that gave you that positive reinforcement to keep going with it it, it, it actually sounds incredibly pathetic now that you uh, think back with the modern technology because well that was cutting-edge stuff at the time yeah so. it was uh, you didn't even have um, uh, disk drives at the time. You used a cassette uh, recorder, uh, like you would have for music, uh, but you would store your programs on there. And I remember you always had to get the volume just right to actually get it uh, to work. And that was because uh, a lot of times you try to load a program and it wouldn't work because you had the volume set too high or, or too low. Uh, but I, I'd say what it did was the thing that made it uh, so exciting was this fact that you could provide instructions and it would do something and that something maybe even would just be scrolling your name across the screen which uh, at the time but you were the one who gave it those instructions to do that mm -hmm. and that was kind of uh, cool and then you progress to more games and creating uh, different uh, games that you could uh, play on there or, or even at the time yeah. there used to you could buy books of games you could type in uh, to so what run. were the games? What were the games that you uh, liked at the time? Actually, the ones that were a lot of fun uh, at the time, that was probably my favorite, uh, which I'm sure now violates all kinds of copyright, was Star Trek. Uh, that uh, there was a, a Star Trek game that the graphics of it were a 10 by 10 grid, 
where uh, I think your uh, it was a 10 by 10 grid, and I think your ship was the E for Enterprise, and stars were Aztrix, and Ks were Klingons, and they would just appear on this grid, and you could choose if you wanted to use uh, your phasers or uh, torpedoes or moving uh, and move energy to shields. And that was probably the most advanced game uh, out there at the time. Do you tell these stories to your students? Like, I remember, this is like walking uphill both ways type of yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I try to avoid it, but I, I fail at that. Uh, in fact, it, it's interesting. I ran, uh, I just ran the numbers uh, recently because I, one of the classes I've uh, been teaching is uh, fundamentals of business for non-business majors. Okay. That's taken by a senior. The, but the engineering, poli sci, uh, life sciences. It can be any what is the title of that? What's it called? It's uh, fundamentals of business for non-business majors. Oh, that's what it's called. Cool. Okay. Yeah, and we cover marketing, management, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, mm -hmm. supply chain, ethics, yeah. globalization. There's a sister course that does accounting, finance, and law. Okay. Uh, but I um, realized that at various times I would say, well, when I was an undergrad here, X was the fact. Right. But then I, I ran the numbers and I was thinking, well, when I was a student, when I would have been a senior, how if a professor said that to me, what era would they have been referring to? <laughs> and I realized it was Eisenhower was president. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, oh, that, that would have seemed ancient. <laughs> so I tried to avoid yeah. uh, too much of that. You don't seem that old. So that, that's, uh... yeah. I don't think I am, but yeah. that... That's what the numbers showed. Um, so tell me about the early days of your career. Um, so you went to Madison, and then you did a stint at IBM too. Yeah, I, it, that was probably one of the things that I, uh, I, I am I, lessons learned uh, as well is that uh, the way I got that IBM stint as a summer intern, I was uh, pre completing my freshman year here at UW, and it had the. Uh, and I took a chance in that IBM was interviewing for summer interns, and the rules were that, or the the policy, or, or what they said they wanted, was uh, that you had to be a junior. Uh, that they were looking to hire people between their junior and senior year. I was only they want to a, hire you, yeah, yeah. You kind of do a summer internship and then hire you the next year. But I was between freshman and sophomore year. Uh, but I uh, took a chance and kind of went down there, even though. Their, uh, what they were looking for, I know I, I didn't fit the bill, and uh, and there was uh, and just started talking to one of the uh, IBM managers at the time. Boca Raton uh, was where they had their office, and that's where the home of the PC was at the time. And it just it kind of talked with him and uh, hit it off. And he was an, a pretty much a maverick at IBM in the sense of the, while the policy was you were supposed to hire juniors, he kind of was willing to break policy and I ended up uh, getting an offer. Uh, and so as a freshman, uh, was uh, had a summer internship at IBM in uh, Boca Raton and uh, was a, probably the one of the biggest br uh, breaks I had in my career you know, very early on because once you have that experience, uh, all the subsequent interviews were a lot easier because, oh, you'd worked at IBM right. and uh, were able to get uh, other summer internships and opportunities that wouldn't have been available otherwise. Yeah, and so in the early days when you were at IBM, what was something that you learned um, or that was influential for you? Uh, that was a, the most influential experience from that summer for me. Uh, there was some. I, I worked on a project there uh, as a, an intern where we were uh, helping them test their CPU design uh, for a specific CPU chip that they built. And that uh, back in that era, every time you uh, took a, a CPU that you designed, you would put it out to silicon. Uh, silicon and then run it and uh, test it and if it didn't work you'd have to go back and fix it and redo that process and that was a multi-million dollar process wow. so every you put it out to a chip if it didn't work that was going to set you back a few million wow and they had created some testing programs uh, to come to do that why was it so expensive uh, well, it, because they actually would create um, these, they would etch uh, etch the uh, the way they make silicon, 
is a lot of etching uh, uh, and then laying down uh, that and putting it on a chip was just, I guess, very expensive uh, at yeah. that point. I, mean, I think it's still fairly pricey uh, t today even uh, to make a brand new chip is, uh, you know, a billion. I think Intel spends a billion or so <laughs> you know, doing that. Uh, but what we did is we actually uh, helped run through some testing protocols and flag different errors. Any, and we found 13 errors, any one of which would have tanked this chip. Wow. And so I, I felt really proud that they, you know, I paid for myself that summer and then some. A couple million, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, the real key learning from that was every engine, that all of those errors that we discovered, not a single one was a technical or engineering mistake made by any of the engineers. They were all communication problems. Hmm. Where one department made a change but didn't communicate it to another department. I see. And, and so that actually was a key lesson learned for me uh, as a career that it's that just being strong in a technology uh, was good, but that wasn't, in fact, sometimes that wasn't even the problem. That there were people were great at that, but being able to communicate and manage uh, the uh, organization was what really was going to add value and that altered, I'd say that altered my career uh, because I uh, that then decided to move towards uh, double majoring in economics and shifted more towards the business realm yeah and I know you did um, a long you were working a long time at McKinsey what are some good uh, McKinsey day stories that, that oh. you learned <laughs> Yeah, McKinsey was a great place. Uh, they were uh, a lot of great people there, and uh, you did travel uh, an incredible, incredible amount. Uh, yeah, I'd say the epitome of the travel was I uh, at one point I was spending so much time at a hotel in St. Louis uh, that uh, the bellhop there, when I uh, tipped him for bringing uh, my uh, bag up to the room. Uh, refused my tip and said he was insulted because I was considered family. <laughs> you you live there, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's when you know you've been on the road too long. Where uh, they they do that, but uh, from a, the business uh, standpoint, uh, we had some great. Uh, there was a place that you had just lots of companies uh, that both were stellar companies that uh, were very high end that were looking to I improve and other companies that were in you know, very much kind of turnaround situations mm -hmm. and uh, the, I'd say the key lesson I learned from that was uh, the importance of getting out and talking to customers because mm -hmm. even co these companies that had huge market research functions uh, were uh, you know, brand name uh, customer goods, uh, consumer goods companies that uh, you'd think would know everything about their customer. Uh, you would, you, we would go out and meet with customers, you know, hang out in stores in the shelving area, yeah. talk to them, and come back with insights. Tell that, me about one of those. Tell right. me about one of those. Um, you know, one of the, the one of them was we uh, actually went out to a uh, uh, a store and. Uh, you kind of found out that uh, I, I don't want to use the br specific brands. Uh, That's but, fine. Yeah, uh, I, you know they always taught us about uh, keep it confidential. Yeah, for yeah. years, but uh, still in confidence that there um, were a certain segment of the population actually um, it was considered this a brand of diaper was considered a prestige brand of diaper. Really? So uh, that you would. Uh, if possible, they would go at the, to the grocery store, and when they were getting a box to put their groceries in, they'd want to get that box so that they could really? uh, put that out on the curb in their garbage uh, to uh, kind of signal uh, to their neighbors that they had this uh, you know, premium. They were using the premium diaper versus what they were actually you know using there and who would have thought how did that? you figure that out i mean i'm picturing you hanging out by the like in the aisle what what how does the process work for that well it, it's actually when you know because you're talking to people in the stores the stock boys the you know uh, people that are uh you know begging the groceries right and, right 
you start to hear, you know, you just make up, a, strike up a conversation, and you hear about uh, the, those sorts of things uh, from different people. So, you know, so it, it's like I said, it, the key lesson there is when you're talking to people and listening to what they have to say. It's amazing what you'll learn, and just how people are using the product, uh, how they are. Uh, even uh, you people don't realize uh, companies uh, often don't realize how their products being used right. in many many situations. Yeah, that seems to be uh, you know kind of a trend that probably people don't focus enough on because they think they maybe know the customer and they don't dig deep. What's something that you remember hearing? Yeah, that you learned, and then the company changed something because of, you know, what the consumer was saying. Do you remember one of those situations? Yeah, um, I'm just curious of what actually they implemented because of that consume what the consumer was saying that they didn't know otherwise. Yeah, well, one um, and one interesting one is that uh, uh, there was a uh, company. Um, I'm trying to maintain confidentiality. Let's still make this right. a good story. Like a general, like uh, okay. There was a lo a, a padlock company that had um, a very very strong brand name, and in fact, uh, when you would talk to consumers uh, and ask them uh, about not padlocks but door locks, uh, the padlock company's name would be mentioned as one of the top brands in the door lock industry. Hmm. Ironically, they did not have a door lock product. Wow. So even without having a product in existence, they were still viewed as one of the top products in that space. So uh, what they did is they uh, went out, acquired a door lock company, and then uh, put, so the old brand they acquired, uh, let's say it's Jeremy door locks, right. they put their brand in small letters underneath it. Then the next year it grew <laughs> and the next year until Jeremy door locks was not on the, on there anymore. And just this padlock company with had the brand was there and very successful because they, uh, but it was something that if they didn't have a product, uh, it just so happened in talking to consumers in, in a related but different area, Come to find out that they they already had a brand without a product there. Yeah, yeah. So what then brought you to parts now? I had wanted to do something uh, more entrepreneurial. Uh, McKinsey, most of our clients at the time were Fortune 100 or, or, uh, or the smallest would be Fortune 500 companies. So very large companies and wanted to. Uh, do something with a smaller company, uh, more entrepreneurial, and and also um, what really was hoping to get back to Madison yeah, as well. Uh, you, it's a wonderful city, uh, great Love place. It, yeah, yeah uh, and kind of like yourself, it, uh, you know, had a wonderful time here as an undergrad. So I have a certain fondness for it. Met my wife here, so uh, we had this as kind of high on our list of places to live and. Uh, then they had the opportunity to join Parts Now as the uh, COO. There. So, what is Parts Now? Parts Now is a computer printer parts distributor and repair depot. So, mm -hmm. for any of your, I'd say, business printers, mostly laser printers, uh, they had the products, uh, the, the parts that of anything that would break on that device. Uh, it didn't at the time didn't sell the toner, but sold everything else. Uh, that would go along with it, and then also could repair components, circuit boards, etc. And they would sell to whoever the technician was. That was their customer, the uh, technician, either in the company or an independent tech. Yeah. So how did you find them? Actually, uh, I um, did a marketing uh, campaign uh, or job search, if you will. At the time, I uh, just uh, went and got a list uh, through McKinsey, I think, at one of the databases and said, in the 608 area code, I want to uh, look at every company that's over a certain size in revenue, I forget what the cutoff was, and then I got that list and uh, deleted any companies that I didn't, that I, I'm, I knew I wouldn't be a fit, so let's say right. a, a car dealership or something. Right. That, a million in revenue could be a great business, but I uh, I didn't see myself. Uh, you don't have a passion for that, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a passion for it, and uh, then sent a sent emails to 
uh, those CEOs and just say, here's my background. I'm, you know, I think I could add value in your organization and I uh, let them uh, respond from there. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the major things you and the company did? Because that's remarkable. The revenue from 26 million to 400 million. Yeah, it, it was rapid uh, growth, and what uh, we did, it had been a very high growth company, and after about two years, the founder decided he wanted to sell out uh, of the business, and uh, we, so I, that's where I helped lead the management buyout with a couple of private equity uh, groups out of Chicago, uh, Bank of America, Capital Investors, and Sawota Collins were our two private equity sponsors uh, that helped fund uh, the buyout. And so... Once we bought that, uh, bought the company uh, from the founder, a couple of things we did that really worked well is we made um, the whole management team became owners uh, in the company. Wow. Okay. And uh, made, uh, we put some money in and, and became investors, but then had uh, a share of the upside as well. So, so it's sort of like the management kind of orchestrated the purchase, so they yep. own the company. So, uh, in the way this works, uh, if you do a management buyout for a company that was that size, is uh, the management uh, helps buy it. Now, it was more money than the management had, uh, so you would bring in these private equity uh, sponsors that also want to invest. So they end up being the majority owner, but uh, management has the out it becomes a, an owner uh, as well. And uh, then we just did, it, that's an amazing impact when you have people that are now owners yeah. in the organization because they just start to think like owners and uh, we, uh, and it adds a, a lot to the, built a great team there and had people that were all uh, sharing the same goal of uh, building this uh, company and uh, it was the sort of industry where uh, if you you had to do a few things right, but you had to do it consistently because if uh, one of our customers had their their printer wasn't working, and it could be a big problem. And, yeah. and if we promised them that you're going to get that. Uh, we'll send you the part tomorrow morning, and it'll be a working part. If we drop the ball on any of those dimensions of we didn't ship it out on time, we had an error and we shipped it, or it got there and it was broken, that was a huge issue yeah. uh, because maybe they couldn't print checks that day, or uh, you know people get crazy when their printer's oh, not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and and a lot of times it could you know shut down a business if they. Uh, you have a problem there because uh, they may be the one printer that prints that form or uh, does something. So we uh, had a lot of, uh, that's why it was very important that we be high quality on all those dimensions and uh, just really executed on that and uh, executed better than uh, the rest of the industry and uh, grew that. And uh, as I said, having people, the team, uh, view it as they were an owner in it yeah. also yeah. meant that uh, they started to think like owners and make decisions and it was pretty exciting to see uh, people make decisions as uh, owners versus uh, just uh, an employee. Yeah, everyone there is working around the clock now because they own mm -hmm. a piece of the company. Mm -hmm. So what else did they, people do, now they're owners, what else did you do in the company to grow so quickly and so much? Uh, we also uh, did a lot of work to uh, to change the culture of it, and by that I mean in uh, a few th a few things. Because I'm a big big believer that in any organization you need to be working as a team, and that if you have these functional silos or divisions. Uh, which are very easy uh, to be created in, uh, and you think they only exist in big companies, they can easily exist in small companies uh, as well. And that friction is unproductive and just slows your success. So mm -hmm. we did some things like uh, actually changed out all the uh, cafeteria tables from mm. the, uh, they had the smaller circular tables where maybe four people at a time uh, could sit there to put in more just long rows of tables. Interesting. Then when you sit down, you were almost forced to sit fairly close to someone who maybe you didn't know or from a different department. It couldn't be just the four people from your department that were eating together. Even if the four of you were sitting down, you were still sitting next right. to someone who's from a different department. And so over lunch, people would talk, get to know each other, 
uh, build up some just human bonds. So then when there's a problem, you're not calling up a stranger to try to get it settled. You're talking, you're calling up someone you actually know and have talked to about the Packers or you know uh, right. some other uh, thing over lunch, um, and just increases that uh, communication and uh, camaraderie. Yeah. Uh, also, try change the focus from we originally had the best parking spots were for the CEO and um, various titled people to say, okay, we're getting rid of all those, and instead the best parking spots are going to be for the salesperson of the month, uh, the uh, warehouse employee of the month, the uh, manufacturing employee of the month, and focus on what's really important isn't the title, it's who's doing a great job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, changing that culture, because if you can get that culture changed, uh, it, it, when you're going through rapid growth, if you are doing rapid growth with a bad culture, it's like building a house on a rotten foundation. It's just, it's going to end up crumbling. And so you needed to have something that was uh, going to be stable as you expand it. Yeah. Another answer I was not expecting, get a long table, switch out the cafeteria tables. Um, yeah. So... Dan, what about um, what's some big challenges, um, mistakes from that you learned from from parts now? Yeah, in probably the um, the one of the early ones uh, that I I remember I would uh, as the CEO, especially a new CEO, uh, you end up having to you end up having to make a lot of decisions, and you would like to say, oh, I'm going to analyze the situation and it'll be obvious what the right answer is. Uh, but first off, you usually don't have the time or data to really analyze it most of the time. And uh, you are, are going to have to make more decisions uh, than necessary. So uh, you end up dropping, uh, so you make a decision and sometimes it would be you know, hiring someone and realizing that, okay, that was a mistake. Uh, or uh, make, instituting a policy and then realizing it was a, a mistake. And the key thing I learned from that is uh, you, you need to be willing to say, okay, that was a mistake. <laughs> uh, you know, How do you was... do that? How do you actually admit to that? Because again, you're the leader and yeah. you want to show confidence, but in the same sense, you want to be truthful. What do you do? Yeah, and and I always tried to be uh, not overly defensive and you know be willing to admit that uh, you know I was going to make mistakes. Now I also felt my batting average was above average uh, on those decisions, uh, and you know I'd like to think the team felt that way uh, as well. Uh, but uh, the thing uh, you didn't want was to have. So I would be willing to say you know that okay that was you know my call that obviously didn't turn out. Uh, you know let's. Uh, you know what? What did we learn from that? What did I learn from that? And you know what? What's the plan B on mm -hmm. that? Uh, because a lot of times, if you get so caught up in, well, this is my decision, so we're going to keep driving that way, uh, you end up making a, a huge uh, mistake. And, yeah. and the other important thing there is, as far as uh, the culture goes, you want to have an environment where the employees um, don't view they don't you don't want them to view you as infallible because they actually know so much more than you do about a lot of specific situations and, and issues. So, you know, I could tell people, I, this is what we should do, and they may know something about, well, it, it just so happens we're out of that component part, you know, or we're out of the spring that right. we need to, to do that. If they are afraid to tell you or uh, don't want uh, to be the one to um, bring that up, uh, you end up making some really bad decisions. Yeah. No one tells you about it. Right. So, uh, how do you foster that? Because it kind of goes the same thing with the consumers, right? You want the consumer to tell, give you feedback, and also you want the staff mm -hmm. who knows to give you feedback. How do you foster that environment so that they do feel comfortable, yet they kind of see you as listen to my authority when I do have a big decision to make? Yeah, I I think the um, the other thing is you do want to celebrate your good decisions uh, when you make a successful one. So especially as a new CEO, uh, it's very important to get some early wins uh, when people are just watching uh, you. Yeah, yeah, and and that was uh, like parts now a couple uh, things I did early on. I, I met with probably met with about half of the employees, and at the time we had maybe 120. 
And so I met with about half of them in either one-on-one -on -one or a very small group mm -hmm. uh, setting and just said, you know, what, uh, how could you be more successful in your role? How could the company be more successful? Mm -hmm. And they had you know, lots of great ideas. Yeah, what are some of the things that, that you heard at the time that, that yeah, really helped? At the time, um, we actually had uh, one problem we had talking to the salespeople was that you uh, they were out of stock. So if uh, they would have a product that uh, was out of, like, yeah, you know, I get calls from customers and we don't have this remanufactured or uh, fuser, which is one of the big selling items. We, right. Let's say we're out of this fuser, we're out of them. So, um, so as a uh, uh, kind of, uh, my economics training said, well, one solution when you have a shortage is to raise price, and that you know that has the benefit of being more profitable for the both the salespeople and the the company. So that's one one of the things we uh, did to alter that because mm -hmm. uh, selling them too low uh, and then being out of stock doesn't uh, it's not good business sense. But then uh, the other thing in talking to other people in the manufacturing area was, well, we have the problem of uh, when we're working on, we're, we're repairing model A, and we'll just do one of those or a couple of those, and then we'll get a call saying, oh, I, I'm going to need some model Bs. So we change over and start working on model B, and then, oh, I'm going to need some model Cs. And so they change over and we do that. And as you can imagine, if when you're working uh, on, if you're chain, you're not in a groove at all. And uh, for some of these models, they could, they could uh, let's say, build six uh, or six, let's say six or eight an hour. So fairly quickly they could work through them. Uh, but if you're changing every so often, uh, you don't get in a groove. So what, um, and they were responding to calls from the salespeople saying change this and you had you know, 25 salespeople all calling down. Uh, telling, Overwhelming. Yes, and so that just seemed like a crazy uh, situation. So um, what I did was um, actually wrote a very simple spreadsheet and said, salespeople, you no longer call down and tell them what to build. We're going to look at what the orders are, just entering in the computer. And based on those orders, we're going to look at what the stock is, uh, what we have in inventory, and then uh, what needs to be, what's the highest priority to be built. And then uh, the manager of the manufacturing area could go and say, okay, you know, Dan, you're going to spend all day working on this one model. You know, go to it because we need. You know, you're going to need them. Jeremy, you spend you know, the first four hours on model B, and then the next four on model C, uh, because that's what the highest priority is. And it, you know, it was, it was a big change. Um, but and it was actually you know a lot of the salespeople didn't want that to change because they were used to calling down there, and all of a sudden I can't call. Right. They felt they had more control than they did when they were calling down. Right. Uh, uh, but then once um, you work through a week of that and all of a sudden, wow, we seem to have better availability than we did before and the work is getting, we're producing a lot more than we ever have and so the availability is better and uh, people are actually working and not answering the phone or, or spending all this time calling and then walking down there. Um, it was one early win that said, okay, here's a change that maybe we weren't real keen on but obviously it's worked out yeah and that's uh you bring that up and i think that's an important point because you kind of even if you hit me you know this is the right decision you have to get people on board how do you get those people on board so they are you know excited about it because it, you know everyone resists change yeah yeah I, one of my saying i like the saying uh, i forget where i heard it but the only people who like change are babies with wet diapers right <laughs> It, it's human nature to actually, I think, fight change. So you want to, uh, you need to end up having uh, to get the team on board. I, I would say uh, the that is also an area of just communicating what is the end goal and making sure people have a shared end goal on that. And uh, then also viewing bad news not as a personal attack on anyone, as more of well, what's the root cause? What caused this? What can we learn from it? What mm -hmm. can we improve from that going forward? Yeah, yeah. are all the things that you, you want to build up that culture of open communication because otherwise you end up with a lot of finger pointing and 
uh, and the fact that uh, people are willing to give things a, a try. Uh, but also, you want to be willing to, when you fail, uh, admit it and change uh, fairly quickly so yeah. that you can say, okay, we're going to try this. If it doesn't work, we'll, you know, we can change to something else, maybe even change back. But yeah. Uh, we want to give it a shot. Yeah. I mean, Dan, obviously you've had a, a lot of success in your career. What's been a painful moment or a low point? Probably one of the lowest points uh, for me was we, uh, as part of this, uh, we bought uh, parts now and then and had, you know, phenomenal growth there, uh, expanded the business quite a bit. Uh, we then uh, acquired another company up in Minneapolis, which was much larger, called Caton Corporation. And they did, they were similar business, but they did copier parts and supplies. And as uh, part of that, uh, probably about six months into, after we acquired them, uh, we found out that uh, they uh, had broken some laws. Oh, man. And, yeah. And so uh, the board uh, asked me to move up there and uh, take over uh, that operation to kind of get through a federal investigation of uh, some things that uh, the previous management and, and um, been involved in and ownership. So while it was nothing we had done, when you buy a company, you buy their history. Yeah. And you buy kind of whatever uh, they had done uh, previously. So that was an incredibly uh, difficult, difficult time because you were kind of running an organization you didn't really know um, the organization uh, as well because I hadn't grown up in it and we had just acquired it a few months earlier. And you were going through this investigation where you never knew what was going to, uh, all of a sudden some email was going to pop up or what did someone do uh, or or didn't do. And uh, you and every so every day uh, was a little bit of, What's going to be stressful? It was a very stressful time, and it, my the key learning I tell people from that is, uh, quite simply, um, whatever you do, avoid being part of a federal investigation. <laughs> uh, you know, there, what, that's the. Well, how do you think? The, do you think it could have been avoided, or was wasn't something that would have even come up? Um, it it would have been. I mean, I, they they um, did things that. Uh, they shouldn't have done so. There, that's clearly could have been avoided and could have been avoided. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, if you're someone's going to buy a company, what things should they look at that yeah. they may be in that situation now? And they're like, "Damn, that sounds really scary. What do I look at so I yeah. see something that maybe you know you didn't see at the time?" You, and that's a great question, and that's one that I've spent many hours uh, contemplating. I don't know what could we have done uh, differently there. I think the we went through a lot of due diligence uh, on it. Um, cl you know, clearly not quite enough. Uh, I I would say the key takeaway that I would uh, pass along on that is that if you th there's the old saying, there's never only one cockroach in the kitchen. Right. And if you so if you see something, even if that something isn't a big deal, uh, but that there is something there. You really should be concerned that uh, that's not the only thing out there, and there could be other things, and those other things could be bigger deals. Yeah. So if you see some, uh, just from an organization that yeah. uh, is cutting corners or doing something that you think is wrong, I I actually think at that point that there, you almost have to assume you're never going to be able to find it all in due diligence. Right. And have to assume there's probably more there than meets the eye, and can you live with that or not? Yeah. What's an example of something that someone would see that would be small that may grow into something bigger? I remember, you know, when I was reading the tipping point, it was like if you catch the people doing just the graffiti, mm. then that those people are, you know, going to commit larger and larger crimes. So it's kind of like the same same scenario. What would be an example of something that? Some would yeah. see that wouldn't seem like a big deal, but maybe would maybe a tipping point later on. Yeah, probably the one of the things to really look at is, especially if it's a private company, and uh, kind of what is the owner running through the business expenses, uh, and that maybe is personal mm -hmm. expenses. 
uh, because that's a, a gray area, and uh, you know people do uh, different uh, can do different things there. Uh, but this, you know, there. This was one area where the previous owner there had run through, you know, lots of um, uh, huge dollar amounts right. of things that weren't business related, that were you know, antique antiques for his personal use, ex kind of et cetera. Mm. And that that sends a that maybe in the total dollar amount of the deal wasn't big. But it does send something like, well, if they're willing to do that, it's ethical. Yeah. Yeah. What else are they willing to cut corners? Gotcha. Now, so going from a you know painful moment, what's been a really proud moment for you? Yeah, I I would say the uh, one of the proudest moments, um, and going back to uh, parts now as well. Uh, and this is something that I wouldn't have predicted early in my career, but uh, we had. Um, a lot of great financial success at parts now, but probably the proudest moment is the people development. And uh, when I've had various uh, people's, uh, people on the management team uh, that have you know, told me or it, when they've been interviewed uh, in other areas have uh, listed me as a, a mentor or you know, inspiration uh, for them, yeah. uh, which is always kind of not something that I had um, you know, thought about probably as consciously as I should have, but uh, it fills me with probably some of the proudest uh, feelings I have of feeling that I've had that sort of a positive impact on uh, some people. Yeah. So, what? Who are some of your mentors and the best advice they've given you? Yeah. Um. One of my uh, mentors was actually at McKinsey, a fellow named Doug Milroy, who I think was my first uh, manager uh, when I was there, and he uh, was uh, re his probably his best advice uh, was. A, on a couple fronts, but one was work. He said, "Whatever you're, whatever you're working for a client." And McKinsey had all kinds of clients. He said, "Look to see either what you should would learn from every situation, either what you should do in the future or what you should avoid doing in the future." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, and that was actually, I think, very good advice because it means that if in your career, when you're in a bad situation. You're still viewing it as well. Okay, this is a bad situation, but I'm learning a lot because I'm learning what not to do going forward, or what I'm going to avoid. Bad because you what you saw the clients doing, or because of what you did. Usually, what the in this situation, it's kind of what the clients were doing mm -hmm. that learn uh, from their kind of their success or mistakes uh, there of what uh, what you had. Uh, and, and and you know, there's yeah, there's some. You know, good stories uh, there. I, what, I mean, one story. In fact, some of the my cafeteria table uh, story is based on something I saw at a, a client uh, as well. And uh, and there's one client I worked at that I had uh, in a kind of an executive dining room that had the you know this three inch thick. Plush uh, carpeting, uh, waiters with white gloves, walnut paneling. I mean, it felt like it was something out of the Mad Men or you right, know, a, right. a different kind of different world. And that was just for senior VPs and above. And uh, it was in a big office building. And uh, they didn't even have a cafeteria. They had vending machines for the rest of the employees. So wow. you, you know, huge, huge gulf there. And you, uh, and this was at the corporate headquarters. And then you know, I went out to uh, their manufacturing operation, and they had probably the worst labor relations uh, you could imagine of any organization. It, it just you, you'd swear that people were at war, and you know they weren't. They're were trying to do what they could to uh, not get a good product out the door, but to blame the other person for it not being a good product. Interesting. Was all their focus, and I don't think those two things were unrelated. Right. Uh, I think every employee in that company had heard about this beautiful uh, executive dining room when they were eating on a vending machine, and and I had yeah. your kind of three dollar tenderloin sandwich and and that. So those were sorts of examples where yeah. you realize that culture has an impact on the whole organization. Yeah, and that's your stress with the culture in the cafeteria. That's interesting. Um, so what brought you to be the director of entrepreneurship? Uh, I, after um, sold out of uh, parts now, I was uh, thinking about well, what else would I like uh, to do? And um, as an alum of the UW Madison, 
I always have a lot of passion for the school, and uh, one of my uh, personal driving forces is uh, wanting to have an impact and having an impact in lots of different dimensions, one of which is uh, people and uh, and entrepreneurship's an area that is uh, very people focused and I saw a need for there being more startups, more, uh, this, is what, this is what the country needs, this, I mean, this is what our state needs, this is what the country needs, this is what the world needs, really more skilled entrepreneurs in lots of different areas. And I uh, thought, well, I think I've got something to help, I could share uh, some background and uh, in, I think I'll enjoy teaching and I've really enjoyed uh, teaching uh, students and uh, love entrepreneurship um, as well. So. Uh, I decided, well, I'll give this a try, and uh, it was worked out. So eight years later, I'm still here. I mean, when you went in, did you teach first, or did you go right into the role of the director? I um, actually came in and I taught one class uh, in. Uh, it was for the finance department uh, in their mergers and acquisitions class, and that which was a good. Uh, it was a good experience because it gave me the confidence of okay, I actually enjoy this, and, and it's a lot. First, I'll tell people, and I tell anyone who asks, it is a lot more work than you ever think. Uh, that you uh, uh, would you think it's oh, it'd be a couple hours uh, prep. It's uh, it's a lot more than that. If you want to do a good job, right. it's half time job to even teach a single class, especially as a first time teacher. And uh, and also uh, it was viewed positively by the school. So at the dean at the time, then uh, they had an opening as the director of the Weinert Center, which was a better alignment with my skills and background. And it had some teaching, but then also a lot of uh, work in other aspects of the entrepreneurship ecosystem here at uh, Madison. So after two months, I started here. Nice. So what's been the what's the best part? about being the director of entrepreneurship and what's the hardest part? Uh, the best part of it is you, it is a constantly changing job uh, because you're working with entrepreneurs and these uh, the ideas that the students and the faculty and just uh, people you're talking with come up with are mm -hmm. everyday different. So you, I think this is one of those unique jobs that you could do the exact same job for 40 years and it would be completely different every day because of the fact that uh, the, uh, the ideas themselves that people are coming up with are so dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And the creativity and uh, the speed of change is really amazing. So that's, uh, that's a really enjoyable aspect of it. What are uh, some of the greatest ideas that you've heard that have come out of it so far? I mean, you've been there for eight years. I'm sure you've heard millions of ideas. Yeah. The, uh, you know, a couple uh, ideas that um, students are working on right now that are, are moved forward is, uh, one is we have some students uh, that came out of the PhD electrical engineering uh, department that have created, uh, called CMoto, but it, they've created a new technology for e electric generators hmm. that has a dramatic reduction in uh, weight, size, improves efficiency, and the number of electric generators that exist in the world is huge. So, um, and, yeah, those things are huge. Yeah, right. And, and they're also even smaller ones. They're, they're huge ones, and then there are also a lot of small ones. If you look in a warehouse, in a manufacturing operation that are are smaller, but there's some huge ones as well. It's, uh, and it's a, a big percentage of all of our electricity in the world goes to power electric generator. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those are very, uh, so making those more efficient can have huge environmental impact. And, and their technology also doesn't use rare earth elements, which there are whole kinds of issues with those. Hmm. Uh, so that is something that uh, they uh, can, can come up with and are moving forward to to market with uh, that could have massive um, impact on just the environment and our, in, our entire eco huge, economy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, economy actually uh, in that space. So uh, you're very you're just exciting to you know, see ideas um, like that. Uh, another student that uh, is working on a nano um, silver nanotechnology bandage for burn victims. Wow! So, so what does it do? 
Uh, silver is a natural um, antibacterial uh, agent. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the catch is, if you have too much silver, it actually is toxic, and so you wouldn't wow. heal. So what, by using this nanotechnology where they're putting uh, particles down at just a, a very precise and limited area, it's a biological bandage that is both non-toxic but antibacterial. Hmm. So it prevents these infections, which are very, very prevalent in burn victims. Uh, that's actually a, one of the biggest problems you have with burn victims is a, a, a subsequent infection that takes place. Um, because what the, does the bandage look like? Uh, it, Do they it, have it, working models now, or yeah, it, it would look um, more like, and it's not. Um, it, it would look, I'd say, like a um, almost a, I'd say, a gauze. Um, I mean, it looks like a piece of gauze that's okay. flesh colored, uh, kind of thinner. Uh, yeah. It would go on, so it's not. It's not quite your band aid, band aid, uh, or bandage, but uh, it's something that would go in, right in the burn area. Yeah, that's really but, cool. I could see how you could just want to do this job all day long. Uh, yeah, and you know, lots of neat people are coming up with, uh, you know, internet companies and uh, and that as well that you, uh, you kind of fun to see. In fact, one of our local uh, startups uh, here in town started by a couple undergrads uh, here called Eat Street is doing online ordering and then delivery of food. And have dramatically expanded. They started here in Madison. They're on, I, I think they're um, over a hundred different cities. Wow, and, uh, kind of massive uh, expansion there. And it, and it's just a good idea, kind of yeah. good idea that they got as college students uh, that they built up a whole uh, business around it. Yeah, I could probably ask you about these ideas all day. Yeah. What's the what's been the hardest part? Of being director is like you said it's it's uh, not always as easy as people see, it seems from the outside yeah I you know I'd say the hardest part uh, and this is probably because of my uh, entrepreneurial drive and uh, background being a, a CEO is it, the UW is a huge institution and it it's you know the pro is there's no decision I could make that would sink this institution. When you're CEO, you know, every night you go to sleep, you'd say, okay, if I made, I could make a bad call here and we're all out of, you know, all of these, we're all done for. Uh, there's no decision I can make that can sink the UW uh, here. Uh, I'm not even sure there's a decision the chancellor could make that could do that because it's just that big of an institution with a, enough uh, inertia. That means it's also, you know, very bureaucratic and uh, tough to, uh, very slow moving. I mean, I think that's probably the frustration at times where as a CEO, you kind of could say, okay, I see a problem. I think this is a solution. Boop. Let's, you know, let's do it. Right. And that is a, you know, morning meeting and you're, you've gone from problem recognition, discussion right. to proposed solution. Here it's, you know, often, well, what committee, you know, who will, who needs to be brought in? Who can can do that? And uh, it just is so. It's much slower. Yeah, I mean that's polar opposite. You know, the word entrepreneurship and then bureaucratic are two completely different timelines. I guess right. you could say. So, Dan, I have one last question for you. I appreciate your time. Uh, before I ask it, just tell people where they can find out more about you, find out more about the program, what you're working on now that's most exciting. Yeah, uh, our um, the best place to go is actually uh, if you go to the um, Weinert Center, and that's W E I R E N T at uh, UW Madison, and our, our website there has uh, our newsletter as well as a lot of different activities that are going on uh, here in on campus and in town. Yeah. So my last question is: What obviously you know you work with tons of entrepreneurs, tons of ideas. What's the most valuable advice, advice that you give to entrepreneurs who come to you for mentorship? Be willing to fail uh, and uh, view it as you're taking, if you're not taking any chances, uh, you're not going to fail, but then you're not actually pushing the things uh, the way you want to. to. So mm -hmm. you... you so be very willing to fail and, and think about, well, what would failure look like? And usually that gives them a lot of confidence that life's not that bad. It's like, okay, I did this startup. It didn't work. I am then in my mid-20s with a 
college degree from a premier institution and will have very little difficulty getting a gainful employment and making mm -hmm. more money than I need to to survive. That's not a bad failure outcome. And uh, you gives them some confidence to then say, okay, I'm, I want to take a swing at doing something uh, that has the potential to be great. Mm -hmm. So Dan, who else should I be interviewing from Madison? Well, you uh, talk to Lori Benson, which is she's, one of our- She's great, yeah. Yeah, she's a, kind of a great person to talk to. And uh, Erica Gruen is another great, uh, she has a wonderful story. Uh, oh, did she give you Tony Sykes as well? Because Tony is another person who has some, uh, has kind of an amazing story uh, as well there. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Dan, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. People should check out uh, the Entrepreneurship Center. And, you know, Dan, it's been wonderful. Thanks, Jeremy. Pleasure talking with you as well. And thanks for the opportunity. Take care.